Hello, this is Ashok Srinivasan from the University of Michigan. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to everyone about tinnitus. Let's have a look at specifically the classification of tinnitus and the role of imaging in its evaluation. Well, what is tinnitus? Well, tinnitus is something that is pretty common. So it's a sound that's perceived without an external stimulus. And patients often describe it as a buzzing sound, a ringing sound, a whistling sound, and sometimes even a whooshing sound. And it is not surprising to know that a large number of people are affected by tinnitus at some time or other in their life. And it's estimated that there could be around 40 million people just in the United States alone. So this brings us to a prevalence of about 7 to 30 percent. For the most part, tinnitus, when it occurs in many people, tends to be mild, barely noticeable, and transient, which means it occurs in a particular week, you feel it, you hear something strange, and then it disappears, you don't do anything about it. But in a small proportion of patients, tinnitus can be quite debilitating and interfere with day-to-day -day activities. Now, as far as tinnitus is concerned, it is critical to obtain a detailed history on associated symptoms. So, does the patient have hearing loss? Does the patient have vertigo? Are there headaches? And after you do this, a thorough physical exam, an otological exam through the scope, as well as audiological testing is important. Because before the patient gets sent for any type of imaging evaluation, we need to have a full comprehensive clinical evaluation. As far as classification of tinnitus is concerned, we can think about it in a few different ways. The first being, is it non-pulsatile or is it pulsatile? Which means, is it coinciding with the heartbeat or is it completely random? And is it subjective versus objective? Which means, does the patient hear it or does the patient and the provider who might be standing next to the patient or the patient's family hear it? It is not surprising to know that most people have non-pulsatile tinnitus compared to pulsatile tinnitus. That is far more common. And most people have subjective tinnitus where they perceive the tinnitus, but somebody standing next to them doesn't. If you also think about it in a different way, non-pulsatile tinnitus for the most part tends to be just subjective only. Whereas pulsatile tinnitus tends to be subjective in some patients or subjective and objective in a few other patients. Let's now talk about how to look at the evaluation for non-pulsatile tinnitus. For the most part, again, this is associated with functional injuries. This usually occurred because the patient was exposed to loud noises, which might have been a single event or a repetitive event when they were working close to machinery, for example. This could also be the effect of medication toxicity. So most patients with isolated non pulsatile tinnitus, they do not have imaging abnormalities. So do not be surprised if your requisition says non pulsatile tinnitus and you did not discover an actual cause on imaging. And if imaging is needed, it is important to correlate with the associated symptoms because that might be a clue to the location of the pathology, such as is there hearing loss, is there dizziness, headache, and so on. And for patients with non pulsatile tinnitus, a contrast-enhanced MRI scan is considered to be the study of choice in this particular scenario. For the most patients, uh, what are we looking for? We are primarily looking for a CP angle or cerebellopontine angle tumor, which is also in most patients going to be a vestibular schwannoma. An example of uh, bilateral vestibular schwannomas is on the left and a unilateral vestibular schwannoma is on the right. There can be other causes of non pulsatile tinnitus as well. And you can see from this particular list, it may not have a specific location. It can be palatal myoclonus from brainstem or cerebellar abnormalities. It can even be multiple sclerosis. So, the gist of it is in a patient with non pulsatile tinnitus, you are looking for vestibular schwannoma and a few other entities. And for the most part, patients will not have any positive imaging. On the other hand, Pulsatile tinnitus can be both subjective or subjective and objective, and the workup most often discloses an imaging abnormality. I like to think of the evaluation of pulsatile tinnitus in three broad categories. Number one, is this a vascular tumor? Let's look at a few examples. 
for the most part the vascular tumor that causes pulsatile tinnitus is going to be a paraganglioma and typically located close to the medullary cavity so it could be a glomus tympanicum it could be a glomus jugulari or a combination which is glomus jugulo tympanicum this is an example of a patient who presented with right sided tinnitus and the culprit is sitting right here in the right jugular foramen so we see on the t2 weighted images a heterogeneous lesion with multiple small areas of t2 flow void multiple small areas of bright t1 signal on pre contrast imaging so this is the pepper on t2 this is the salt on t1 which significantly enhances with contrast and you can also see this displayed within the coronal plane so this is a classical picture of a glomus jugulari here is another patient with left sided tinnitus showing similar imaging features of a mass in the left jugular foramen with flow voids uh, areas of uh, blood products which are in the subacute stage which is represented as the salt intense post contrast enhancement now there is a clue on ct sometimes that can help distinguish a paraganglioma from other tumors that can occur in this location and that is the presence of osseous uh, permeative margin so the margin will not look like it is remodeled it will look like it is moth eaten or permeative and that correlates well with paragangliomas so we have seen a couple of examples of vascular tumors that can cause pulsatile tinnitus the second category that you need to remember is vascular malformation vascular malformation comes in two different flavors it can be an arteriovenous malformation or it can be an arteriovenous fistula in this particular instance the arteriovenous malformation that is displayed in this patient is very close to the skull base is in the region of right carotid sheath and we can in fact see multiple flow voids on the conventional t1 weighted pre contrast mr and we can see on the ap and lateral radio uh, angiograms a significant early venous shunting so this is the common carotid artery and this is the blush within the internal jugular vein this abnormal communication between the artery and vein in the presence of a nidus can cause pulsatile tinnitus here is a different patient with pulsatile tinnitus there is an abnormal communication between the artery and vein with nidus but this one is intracranial so large intracranial avms can also cause pulsatile tinnitus here is a different patient with a arteriovenous fistula this is an abnormal communication between an artery and the vein but there is no intervening nidus here are time of flight mr angiogram pictures what do we see here we see flow related enhancement that is normally seen within the arteries to be also seen within the venous structure so normally the way these are acquired the veins should not show any flow related enhancement unless there has been shunting of some protons early from the arterial system into the venous system so the presence of higher signal in the sigmoid sinus and the jugular vein indicates the probable presence of a fistula and the suspicion goes up once you see an even brighter structure in the mid transverse sinus this patient undergoes a, a catheter angiogram these are lateral pictures from the external carotid picture so for uh, to orient you this is the occipital artery this is the middle meningeal artery and this is the internal maxillary artery more anteriorly so you can see there is shunting that is occurring from branches of middle meningeal as well as occipital artery into the transverse sinus into the sigmoid sinus so this is a av fistula moving on to a different patient here we see venous shunting occurring within the um, neck on a contrast enhanced mr arteriogram normally you would not be able to see many venous structures in this particular type of study so this is a, a antero posterior type of view like a coronal view showing the three main uh, great arteries from the arch this is the left common carotid artery which is bifurcating into internal and external carotid and you can see clearly abnormal venous shunting through the jugular vein as well as the perivertebral venous plexus now what you also see here is on these particular pictures you are able to appreciate um, uh, on the conventional catheter angiogram that this appears to be a very complex av fistula so injection into the right external injection into the left external everything shows that there is some degree of shunting that is occurring into a complex fistula that is draining through the left jugular vein so we've seen two categories a vascular tumor and a vascular malformation
The third category that can cause pulsatile tinnitus is a vascular anomaly. So it is unclear why a vascular anomaly that is supposed to be present for a long period of time and in some instances present since birth can cause pulsatile tinnitus. So if you discover a vascular anomaly, please remember this may be an incidental observation. So keep searching for another cause of pulsatile tinnitus. In some patients with vascular anomalies that especially are present since uh, childhood or birth, you can still get pulsatile tinnitus if the flow dynamics through that vessel changes. To give you an example, you might have a vessel that is abnormal or um, an anomalous vessel since childhood. And if the proximal portion of the vessel gets a stenosis, the distal vessel has changes in flow velocities that can then be perceived as non pulsatile tinnitus. Okay, now let's look at some jugular bulb anomalies. Here is an example of a high riding jugular bulb which is described as extension of the jugular bulb above the floor of the internal auditory canal or the tympanic annulus. So you're seeing the IAC here anteriorly, you're seeing the jugular bulb. This by itself usually does not cause pulsatile tinnitus. Here is an example of a high riding jugular bulb where the anterior osseous margin is missing. So this is dehiscence of the jugular bulb and this can be visible sometimes on otoscopy. And this can cause pulsatile tinnitus because the pulsations from the jugular bulb are getting transmitted to the middle ear cavity. Here is a different patient with not only a high riding jugular bulb and dehiscence, here the bulb itself is projecting into the middle ear cavity. So this is jugular bulb diverticulum. So please remember a high riding jugular bulb by itself may not cause pulsatile tinnitus, but with dehiscence and resence of a diverticulum, this might be the cause of pulsatile tinnitus. Now, this type of assessment is easy to do on thin section uh, bone algorithm CT scans. So this is what I'm showing you here. But you can also uh, determine that a jugular bulb is abnormal on a CT angiogram or an MR angiogram or even an MR venogram. Do not try to diagnose a high riding jugular bulb on conventional T1 weighted and T2 weighted images. Why? It's because the flow void of the jugular bulb is going to appear dark, the surrounding bone is going to appear dark, the mastoid air cells are going to appear dark, so you will not be able to reliably pick out the margins of the jugular bulb if you only use spin echo MR. Here is a different patient with whooshing sound in the left ear. So we took a look at the scan and it looked like the jugular bulb was not high riding, there is no dehiscence, so is this a normal scan? Before you close that study, pay particular attention to this aspect of the sigmoid sinus. So this is where the sigmoid sinus changes its orientation, typically from um, the, the horizontal portion to the vertical portion. It should always be covered by bone, and that is missing here. So there is no osseous covering along the anterior aspect. So blood flowing through the structure will show pulsations that can be transmitted into the mastoids and then subsequently middle ear cavity. So this is called sigmoid plate dehiscence. This is the commonly under-recognized cause of pulsatile tinnitus. Why is it important to recognize? It's important to recognize because it has a higher incidence of cure after surgery. So in this particular patient, you can see this is also projecting more laterally. This aspect is not causing the tinnitus. The tinnitus is caused by absence of the anterior osseous margin. Here is another patient who presented with a right-sided pulsatile tinnitus. The sigmoid sinus shows a diverticulum and absence of an anterior osseous covering. That results in pulsations getting into the middle ear cavity. There can be other causes of pulsatile tinnitus and here is one of them. This is an aberrant carotid artery. So how does an aberrant carotid artery actually develop? To understand that, let's go back to uh, embryological development of this region. So here is the common carotid. This is the internal carotid and the more medially is the uh, external carotid. So this is what looks like in the, this is what it looks like in the normal embryo. You often have a small branch that comes out at the bifurcation or it can be very close to the bifurcation. This is the ascending pharyngeal artery. This has another branch called inferior tympanic that goes through inferior tympanic canaliculus and then anastomosis with a tiny branch called keratico-tympanic that eventually attaches to the petrous portion of the carotid artery. This is how it looks like in most people. 
in certain individuals the cervical segment of the internal carotid never develops but the brain still needs its blood supply right so what happens you develop a significant hypertrophy of your inferior tympanic artery that then anastomoses to carotico-tympanic re-establishing flow within the intracranial internal carotid artery so when you look at this picture from an anterior projection the main thing that uh, is different between these two is the more lateral orientation of the high cervical internal carotid artery so this is why this is called aberrant it looks like it has been pulled out more laterally it is not entering the skull at the carotid canal it is entering the skull at the inferior tympanic canaliculus and because it does this this is going to dive under the cochlear promontory so and i'll show you how it does that so here is a patient with an aberrant carotid so to orient you this is the cochlea this is a relatively high riding jugular bulb here but it still has an osseous covering normally there should be no soft tissue that lies over the lateral aspect of the cochlea this is the promontory here there is abnormal soft tissue that is draping itself and when you look at it on the coronal plane again you can see it draping it itself over the lateral aspect of the cochlea so this is an example of an aberrant carotid artery when you look at this in the anterior uh, projection this can be called as a seven or reverse seven sign as i showed you it looks like the carotid is pulled out more laterally here is a different young kid with a vascular middle ear mass again showing which is uh, draping over the cochlear promontory you give contrast you can confirm this is indeed the internal carotid artery and this is an aberrant ica here is another interesting uh, condition that can sometimes be associated with pulse style tinnitus so i want you to watch the canal here this is the carotid canal and i want you to pay attention to this small artery that's arising from it and this particular vessel is then coursing towards the cochlear promontory it's lying over the cochlear promontory and it stops right where we see the foot plate of the stapes so this vessel is called persistent stapedial artery it is an embryonic vessel that can sometimes persist and can cause complications during middle and inner ear surgeries it can also be associated with pulse style tinnitus how do we recognize a persistent stapedial artery well for one you can trace it from the uh, carotid canal to the cochlear promontory up to the level of the foot plate of stapes or you can actually have some accessory clues as well and the accessory clue being the ipsilateral foramen spinosum will be absent if you recollect from anatomy the foramen spinosum transmits your middle meningeal artery and the middle meningeal in most individuals arises from the internal maxillary artery however in patients with persistent stapedial artery the middle meningeal arises from this particular vessel from within the middle ear and then courses into the intracranial compartment so there is no reason for foramen spinosum to develop because the middle meningeal never arises from the internal maxillary for that reason if you see absence of foramen spinosum look carefully for a persistent stapedial artery there can be certain other miscellaneous causes of tinnitus as well that includes otosclerosis paget's disease meniere's disease and even carotid stenosis or dissections but these are going to be far more rare compared to the other causes that i just presented so in summary what i wanted to present today are uh, certain aspects about tinnitus that we should all remember number one most patients with tinnitus will actually not show any imaging abnormalities and that's fine if you're looking at a patient where the history says non-pulse style tinnitus the ideal test to start off with would be a mri brain typically a eighth cranial nerve protocol to specifically evaluate for a cerebellar pontine angle lesion like vestibular schwannoma if you're looking at a patient where the history is pulse style tinnitus the ideal study that we start off with is often a combination study uh, including a ct temporal bone or ct angiogram mr angiogram and eventually even catheter angiography and if you follow a three prong approach to diagnosing pulse style tinnitus which is look for a vascular tumor at the skull base look for vascular malformations both av malformation and av fistula and carefully look for vascular anomalies including those ones that we commonly forget like sigmoid plate dehiscence i think we'll all do a great job thank you very much for your attention